what is renewable energy? When they say renewable, right, that means uh, it isn't limited. It doesn't take millions of years to make it. It happens every day. The sun comes up every day. The wind's blowing uh, whenever conditions permit, depending on where you're at. So it's not something that is limited. It renews itself. Most people, I think, in this day and age know because discussions about global warming and renewable energy are in the news. So unless you had your head under a rock, you probably figured out you've heard discussions about this. The key there is they're constantly being formed. They replenish themselves. They happen on a routine basis. They don't require the exploitation of any limited resources that are buried in the ground or that can only be used once. Main types, solar, wind, uh, water, hydroelectric, and then geothermal. They say geothermal, we're talking about Earth's heat. Remember, everything affects the environment. Everything you do affects the environment, right? That's that cycles that we've talked about. So whatever means we use to generate energy is gonna have some impact on the environment. Let's talk about solar energy. Solar is the main source of energy for this planet without human activities, right? So every day the sun comes up, every day that the sun is emitting, come, uh, undergoing fusion, as we talked about earlier, sending energy through the 93 million miles between us and the sun, warming the planet, making the plants grow, keeping the oceans melted, everything else. Without the sun, game over, right? So it is the main source of energy for the planet. But we've developed uh, the technology to exploit the sunlight to generate electricity. So that's solar power is an exciting frontier and there's been a lot of progress and there are actually plants. If you go down 96 out towards Lane Packing, where they sell the pecans and the delicious pecan ice cream. If you go out that way, you'll drive by a Georgia Power solar field. You look out in the field and you see a ton of solar panels. Those are oriented, they're generating electricity that gets put onto the grid and helps power people's homes and meet our energy requirements. So this is happening in our neighborhood, certainly in Warner Robins and Perry and in various areas. So I lived in uh, Carter Woods. One of my neighbors got it in his mind that he wanted to get off the grid and he made a huge electric uh, solar energy panel, had three of them. If you drive by, uh, you can see them over at Carter Woods, but he's got them on a rotating so they follow the sun and that's the way he gets electricity. We'll talk about solar power and the science of it in more detail. Okay, so passive solar heating, that's where you use the sun's energy to heat your building directly. So the sun's irradiating your building with all kinds of radiation and heat. And if you face your windows towards the south, you'll notice in your home, if you have a south facing window, because we're in the northern hemisphere and in the summertime, especially the sun travels up to 22 and a half degrees latitude. So it get, that's why our part of the planet gets warm in the summer as the earth goes around 365.25 days around the sun. During those six months, we're closer to the sun. And then for the other six months, we're further from the sun. That's uh, why we have winter. But that heating source is just passively comes and heats your building. So there's ways that you can exploit this phenomenon to uh, put windows in your house and allow the sun's energy to come through and heat your house. If you do this, and people are really serious about environmental, you know, minimizing their carbon impact and other things, if they employ these, they could uh, reduce their energy consumption. You might wonder by how much, Mr. O'Neill, and what's that look like? Well, let's take a look. So here's the sun, and uh, you get the winter sun and the summer sun. As I mentioned, the sun goes, because the earth is on a tilted axis, in the wintertime, we're closer, or excuse me, we're further away from the sun. In the summer, we're closer to the sun in the northern hemisphere. It's exactly the opposite for the people who live in the southern hemisphere, like the Australians. But up here in the, in the winter, uh, you can optimize the amount of sun that comes into your house by placing windows. And in the summer, there's things you can do to uh, get more shade and reduce your cooling requirements. 
these things include thick walls and floors, insulation in particular, right? So if you build a house, a modern house, it's energy conscious. Uh, you can build the walls differently with uh, highly insulated materials to minimize your heating and cooling requirements. Uh, when you put your roof or your attic, you can put a lot of insulation up there. There's ways that you vent to let the hot air get out in the summertime in particular. And then you can have window coverings uh, that would reduce in the winter the amount of heat that you lose through the window. Nowadays with the modern windows, they have a tremendous insulative value. You can buy a high E window. Some of them are quite expensive, but they have argon in between two plates of glass and they have very good insulating qualities. There's all sorts of science that goes into this. And then it doesn't have to be like high tech, right? A simple tree can shade you from the sun that will reduce your cooling requirements. In a climate like Georgia, where we spend most of our electricity on heating, and, or excuse me, on cooling, not so much heating. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you spend a lot, or up in the Northern latitudes, like North Dakota and Minnesota and places like that, you probably don't even have an air conditioner because it doesn't get that hot. But in the winter, you spend a lot of energy heating your house because it's awfully cold outside. In Georgia, the winters are very mild and we spend most of our energy on cooling our houses in the summer. So there's things you can do depending on where you're at to minimize your heating and cooling requirements. In any case, if you insulate your living environment from the outside, you're gonna reduce your heating bills and cooling bills uh, wherever you live. And then you could take it to another level with active solar heating. That's the gathering of solar energy by collectors who use the heat water. Uh, for example, some people don't even have a water heater in their house, they just use the sun to heat their water. And also that power can be used to heat a building. Good morning, if you guys are just joining us, uh, please type your name into the chat so I know who's here. And we are talking about renewable energy. We're in the midst of talking about solar heating, there's passive solar heating that we've discussed, and now we're going to talk about active solar heating, which is a way of bringing uh, the sun's energy to using that to heat or cool your house. Here's what it looks like. So you'll see some houses that have these uh, square boxes, or usually they're square, sometimes they're circular. They usually use a square because it's economical and easy to construct. But here's how it works. So you have cold water comes in from the city. The city of Warner Robins supplies water to your house. You take that and you route it. And if you name, look at the screen, look at the screen, up into something that is exposed to the sun's radiation. So it comes in cool and it's getting heated by the sun. And as it gets heated, it pushes through. And there's a phenomenon in science that cold uh, sinks and heat rises. So as this cold gets heated up, it rises through and actually develops an energy to push it through. Uh, so coming up here, being exposed to the sun, the temperature comes up, comes down into your distribution inside your house, goes into a tank where the hot water's uh, conditioned for use in the house, depending on what temperature you want it at. And then that uh, goes to your hot water spigot for your shower or whatever. So this is an example of using the sun's energy for active solar heating, actually deliberately using the sun's energy to uh, heat water or do other functions. Here's a description of what I uh, explained to you. About 8% of, of the energy used in the United States is used for water heaters. That's a lot when you know it's not a lot for your particular house. However, it's a lot when you look at the entire country. So were every house to have an active solar heating and use the sun's energy that would reduce our energy requirements across the country. Maybe in the future this will be a building code or a requirement. Right now it's pretty much people that want to do it and especially where you have high energy costs in a place like California, uh, people are doing this just to save money. And they're right now at least there has been tax incentives where they would give you a tax credit if you go out and buy a system like this. You can declare that on your taxes and because the government is trying to promote 
green technologies, they'll give you a tax credit and that offsets your cost. So you get that added benefit as well. Whether that continues or not, we'll see right now, it's kind of, we're not real proactive about environmentally friendly initiatives. Moving on, still talking about the sun, but there's something called photovoltaic cells. So there are chemicals that if you expose them to sunlight, they generate electricity. They have no moving parts and they run on non-polluting power from the sun. And this is an extremely exciting technology because the sun rises every day, it's free, and it usually goes to waste, but you can actually make electricity with this. On the other hand, this isn't like a car engine that produces a tremendous amount of power. They pr produce a modest amount of power. If you wanted to make a lot of power, you're going to need a lot of them, right? And you're talking hundreds of acres. If you go down 96 towards lanes, you can see that one power plant, and it is huge. I mean, it takes up, I don't know about hundreds of acres, but certainly tens of acres. So what's that? How's this work? Let's take a look at it. All right, so you have the sun up here. If you ain't looking at the screen, look at the screen. The sun comes in and this chemical here is exposed to the sun. It has a light absorbent coating. Usually they're dark or sometimes look like mirrors. There's a phosphorus and rich silicon is the material that they use. Silicon is a chemical. Uh, it's also the chemical that your phone's made of. But anyway, they enrich it with phosphorus and that uh, they take that silicon, enrich it with boron. Between the two of these, it generates, when that sun comes in, it causes electricity through ionization of these uh, chemicals. That electricity is then collected, distributed through a wire, and can light a light or do other functions from it. So you get electric current flow from the sun's interaction with these chemicals. Hmm some reason, let me see here. Uh, can you guys see me? Yes. Okay, yeah, so um, some reason I'm seeing some weird stuff. Let's see here. All right, so I can't see myself and we'll go with it. What I wanted to do is I have a little photovoltaic cell here and I want to do some science for you and just show you what it looks like. This thing, uh, I don't know if you guys know Northern Tool or there's another store down on uh, Watson Boulevard that sells tools and things. But anyway, I bought this here. I don't know if you can see that. So it's, uh, just hold it up where you can see. Yeah, so this is a 1.5 watt solar char battery charger. So this thing is meant to charge your batteries. It's a picture of it. This box that it come in. And this is what it looks like. I don't know how good you can see it, but it's, you know, it's not very big. It is, I don't have a tape measure, but it's about 18 inches by about six inches. And this thing can make 1.5 watts. 1.5 watts is not very much electricity. However, it's enough to charge a battery, right? Because batteries don't, you know, phones and things don't use a tremendous amount of power, but it's important to keep them charged as you guys are experts at that. So deal, can I charge my phone? Yeah, so, so anyway, how's this thing work? Uh, let's see if you can see the blue light right now. Let's see, so I got a window over here and there's sunlight coming in. I wanna draw your attention to this part mm, right here. Can you see that blue flashing light, Jasmine? Yes. Okay, so that means it's making electricity. Now let me show you what it looks like when it's not making electricity. And obviously the sun is up. So it's making electricity. Let's see what it looks like if you block the sun. So right now the blue light is flashing and you can see that when I block the, the photovoltaic surface with a box that the blue light stops flashing. Once I expose it to the sun again, then it starts generating electricity again. So this is how, and again, this is silicon laced with phosphorus and boron inside and then the collector. Collector comes out through a little wire, right? And the wire, in this case, you have different apparatuses. So these are just like little clips. So you can clip it onto something and charge your car battery. This is uh, meant to be clamped onto your 
car battery terminal. There's different ones. For example, this one comes with one of these. So you don't have to clamp it onto your car battery. You can just plug this into your cigarette lighter or your 12 volt outlet. And then this will take the solar power and put it into your battery. So that's an example of how these work. This thing costs $18. <laughs> so give you an idea of the relative cost of these. They ain't free, but they're not that expensive if you want to use this power. So one might say, Mr. O'Neill, how much power does it make? For that, we're going to need a scientific instrument to measure it. So I'll hook this on. And obviously, when you're measuring electricity, it's got to be a circuit. So I have a negative and a positive one. And it's connected to this meter right here. So this is a, like a $5 electrical meter. So you can see right now, let's see if you can see that is generating some electricity. Let me put it down on the 10 volt scale. So you can see how much electricity by the meter deflection. Let's see if you see the red needle, it is making right now 2.2 volts. That's not great. However, if I take this device and I point it towards my window over here, and you'll see the electricity come up. The more sunlight you get, the more, now if I were to go sit it outside, it's gonna really go through the roof. It's gonna make about, I've checked it before, 18 to 24 volts. So right now with uh, holding the device over towards the window, I'm still indoors, but it's making about six volts. So you can see this is a photovoltaic cell. Uh, this technology, obviously, if you have a huge one or a ton of them hooked together, uh, then you can generate a substantial amount of electricity. Enough to power your house for sure. And Georgia Power is making enough to power several houses. So anyway, that's a demonstration. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. Let's go back and talk about the PowerPoint here. Okay, so you got to see it. That's what it works and looks like. Okay, so now they obviously, can you think of any problems with this source of power? Well, one problem is the sun goes down at night. Right, so when the sun goes down, you don't have any electricity. That's no good because what well, if you wanna watch television or you wanna consume electricity at night, you're gonna to have to find a way to store the electricity you make during the day so that you can use it when the sun goes down. And another thing is weather, right? So you're gonna generate a lot of electricity on a clear, hot day. You're not gonna generate electricity on a cold day or when it's cloudy, right? Because the sun, further away, not, not delivering as much energy, not as much electricity production. So you're gonna need some way to store the electricity and that's usually done via batteries. And uh, batteries is one of the issues with using these renewable energy sources because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. In fact, usually about half the day the sun is down. So that's one of the issues. Uh, I think I talked to you guys about Elon Musk, the guy that runs a company called Tesla, SpaceX. Well, anyway, he's been working on battery technology. It's getting better and better, but we're still not very efficient at storing electricity and power for consumption when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. But speaking of wind, uh, there's a lot more energy in wind than there is in the sun. Uh, when it's blowing strong. And you can generate a lot more electricity using wind power than you can using sun power if you're in a windy place. And there's a, a EPA or somebody puts out a map of the entire country showing what the relatively wind electricity generation capacity is all over the country. In the Great Plains of the United States, places like Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, places like that, Oh my goodness, the wind's always blowing through the plains and therefore they have a lot of electricity generation using huge turbines. So I went out there this summer and saw some unbelievable these things are making megawatts of electricity. They are massive and they're constructing them 
uh, as we speak. They just keep adding thousands and thousands of these things out in the Great Plains. In Georgia, on the other hand, there's not that much wind normally, unless it's like a storm or something. So we're not that good at making electricity from wind. So that electricity is generated in the Great Plains has to be transmitted from North Dakota or wherever to Georgia in order to be consumed. But we have a nationwide network and they can use that power for say Denver, a big city that's closer to them. Wind turbines, there's uh, actually these places are called wind farms now, even though it's not plants, they still call them farms. And there are thousands of these windmills, some of them massive and generating a tremendous amount of electricity that those are supplying homes. They're going on to the grid and that's where the electricity generation and distribution, uh, electricity is made is distributed to a grid to different cities and things. We're all connected together, almost the entire country, but it's generally local. Most of ours comes from Georgia Power. If you're serviced by Flint, they supply your power. The cost is going down uh, because they're, people are making them. There's a General Electric, one of the companies that was founded by Thomas Edison. They're still in business. They are making massive generators with huge turbine blades and they're getting better and better. So if you look at the megawatts installed over time, when I was a kid, when I was in high school back here, there was almost no wind generation. But now since 2000, the government's been involved and the price of energy's gone up and the requirements are going up and people are worried about global warming and the environmental impact of electricity production. So all these factors are making more and more uh, electricity production using that. Hmm. So you can see now it's on the climb, right? And if you look in the future, it's probably gonna go up even more, right? People are worried about global warming and environmental impacts of electricity production. There's every reason to believe. We haven't even scratched the surface, right? You're not gonna slow the wind down. You're not going to have a major impact on this renewable source of energy. You're just gonna exploit the wind. Even you're not taking that much energy out of it to make a turbine turn. The wind's still blowing on the other side of the turbine. It's just blowing very slightly less. So. So we are, this is a very powerful source of electricity. And if we get in a pinch, you start running out of oil or whatever, this could be one source that really alleviates the energy requirements in the future. And the environmental impact's gonna be nothing. It doesn't emit any gases. It's totally renewable. The wind's gonna blow tomorrow, just like it's blowing today. So this is an exciting source. So the windiest spots on earth could generate more than 10 times the energy used worldwide. So the scientists are looking at this saying, hey, if we got serious about this, we could make way more than what we need just using wind. So when you guys are my age, maybe there'll be a lot more wind farms and it could produce hydrogen from water. If they were to do that, that would be great because you could take that hydrogen, put it in your car and drive around wind don't need to be blowing, right? Uh, you could harness that energy, make hydrogen, and put it in your car. And the byproducts of burning hydrogen in your car are only water. So the only thing that comes out your tailpipe is no carbon dioxide gases, just water. So if you found a, an affordable way to produce hydrogen, then that could satisfy our energy requirements big time. So the theory is you could use wind to make hydrogen, It'd be plentiful if you had power to do it. And then that hydrogen could be used for your transportation requirements and other things. So that's some of the possibilities to solve our future energy problems without trashing the environment. Right now, we're just burning gas for the most part. It's cheap and we've been doing it for over a hundred years. So there are other ways. Biomass is one way. So what is biomass? It consists of plant material, manure. Manure is um, excretions from animals, basically poop, or any other organic matter that is used as an energy source. One thing they do is like algaes and things. People are working in this. So if you think of fossil fuels, they're like biomass energy, but they're non-renewable because that's biomass energy from 
millions of years ago. However, uh, there's stuff that we could use today. Wood, right? Trees are growing. We could grow trees. Dung is like a manure. Uh, excretions of animals and insects and things. These could be major source of energy in developing countries. They're already burning wood. They burn uh, poop or manure, dung, uh, cow excretions, cow patties, whatever. They're burning those to heat, cook, and everything else already, right? Because they don't have coal. They don't have power plants and all that stuff. But they do need to heat their food. They do need to cook and all that stuff. I think I told you a story when I was in Afghanistan. They... They're a very poor country. They would cook their food by burning garbage. Find a piece of paper, use that to cook rice or whatever when they burn it. So using that model, they're making electricity without big machines and stuff. So can we do that? That's the, that's the question. So most people, more of the world's wood requirements, right? You build houses with it. You do all sorts of stuff with wood. But over half of the wood that we're using, which has an environmental impact, is being used for heating and cooking. Heat your house with it or cook with it. So obviously there's a developed world and a less developed world, right? So, and here's a map. Hopefully you can see the map. Give me a thumbs up. You can see the map. You there, Jasmine? Good job. Thank you. Okay, so this is the United States here. Canada, like us. Mexico, not a terribly poor country, but poorer than us. Here's Europe, they live like us. Right, they got money, this is a developed country. Here's Russia, they live like us. Right, they are a developed country. And then there's the, this is usually Northern Hemisphere. One country that lives like us in the Southern Hemisphere is Australia. They live like us, they have a lot of energy, they're a developed country. And then most of the southern hemisphere down here, so this is the equator. So they say hemisphere is anything on the south of the equator is the southern hemisphere. Anything north of the equator is the northern hemisphere. Not very many people live up here, it's too cold. But most people live in what's called the tropics between 22 and a half and 20, north and 22 and a half south. So a lot of people live in this area because it's warm. People like warm weather. So this Africa right here is, has a lot of developing countries. So how much biomass do they use? Wood and stuff like that. Where does their energy come from? So in particular, where you see the purple, that means they burn a lot of wood for cooking and heating, right? So you can see these purple countries here. If you ain't looking at the screen, look at the screen. These purple countries burn a lot of wood. They're poor countries, like Myanmar is a poor country. A lot of Africa, some of these sub-Saharan, they call it. Here's the Sahara Desert. If it's below to the south of the Sahara, they call it sub-Saharan. Most of these countries are poor. The only one exception is down here in South Africa. South Africa, they live like us. They have a lot of money. Uh, but most of these countries, sub-Saharan, they're very poor. They burn a lot of wood for their energy requirements. Some cases are over 75%. Some 50%, you can see the numbers. Some they don't even know. They don't have good data on that stuff. And that's one of the challenges of science, getting good data. So you can kind of see where in the world they're using wood and dung, uh, organic sources for heating and cooling already. Now, mind you, they are a lot less energy intensive. They don't have electricity in their homes and stuff like that. They're poor people. Although they're renewable, uh, if you use them too much, you'll deforest, right? Remember we studied that earlier. Deforestation is one of the issues. Another thing, the trees are doing something for the environment. They prevent erosion. We go cutting down all the trees, and this has happened in countries like Haiti. They cut down all the trees, and now they have an erosion problem, and, and, it, and Haiti has got a lot of issues on account of deforestation. It's a classic case of what could happen if you don't manage your your forests and stuff. You get habitat loss. We talked about, we watched that one video from the rainforest or the cutting down, right? And when you cut down the forest, what happens to the animals that live in the forest? They're gone. They lose their habitat. There's issues there. Also, what happens when you burn something, you get smoke. 
Smoke's got all sorts of chemicals in it, could cause smog and other things if the wind's not blowing. And also you're putting out air pollution, including carbon dioxide, right? Classic byproduct of, of uh, combustion. So those are issues, right? So it that makes it not like a burning stuff isn't gonna get us out of our problem in terms of having sustainable uh, energy production that's not going to trash the environment. But it could be part of the problem or part of the solution. Another thing is methane. Methane is a gas that when organic things decompose, no offense, but when we all die, we're gonna make methane gas, just the way it works. So when critters die, the bacteria come in, they start decomposing, whatever it is, a plant, a leaf, a tree, whatever. And when they do that, the bacteria kick out methane gas. Methane is a gas called CH4 is a chemical formula. And so it makes it a hydrocarbon. It's got both hydrogen and carbon in it. That's called a hydrocarbon. But these animals produce stuff. So if you just collect it, then you could use that gas, it's flammable, to generate heat or electricity. For example, uh, let's see, one time I was in the Navy and went to the Red Sea. And they were just so much gas coming out of the oil wells that they were burning them off in a flame above it. They didn't even make any attempt to collect it. So that's methane. Now, there are ways called digesters, right? And just like you eat something, your body digests it. So you could have an industrial machine to collect, for example, human waste or whatever, the sewer, put that in the digester and collect the methane gas that comes off as the bacteria eat it. If you could collect that, then that is actually could be an energy source, right? You could conduct combustion with it, you can make a, a generator. Uh, in the United States, some of our landfills generate electricity by using the methane. Every, all the garbage we put out goes to a landfill, sits in a big pile, makes out methane gas, they can collect that gas and then use it for, you know, heating their buildings or generate electricity for their operations or whatever they want to do. Theoretically, if you did on a large enough scale, big cities, for example, you could collect that methane gas and then put it back into uh, circulation for energy production. But it's not a huge source of electricity right now. Another thing is alcohol. Let's talk about alcohol. And I'm not talking about that kind of alcohol they sell in the bars and stuff. I'm talking about uh, alcohol as a liquid fuel, right? So alcohol is usually made of hydrogen and carbon, different versions of it, all kinds. One kind is called ethanol. Now, they figured out that if you ferment agricultural stuff, uh, for example, corn, you take corn, you ferment it. Fermenting means you allow it to die and decompose. Then it generates a uh, byproduct of alcohol. We've known this for thousands of years, since before we could write even. They've been making beer out of wheat, barley, hops, and oats and things. They make different kinds of, of alcohols. If you take potatoes, you can make vodka. If you take co corn, you can make whiskey. Uh, something called corn mash, like different kinds. And people do this mainly for entertainment, to sell to people so that they can consume the alcohol, either socially or even some alcoholics. But anyway, we've been doing this for many, many years. Beer, wine, you ferment grapes, make wine. You ferment potatoes, make vodka. You ferment... Uh, wheat and other things. You can make whiskey or different kinds. So anyway, you can make alcohol by fermenting plants. So in this country, we are actually one of the major producers of a chemical called ethanol. Ethanol is made by fermenting corn. So we grow a lot of corn and even in Georgia, we grow a lot of corn, but especially in the Midwest, uh, states like Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, where they have these huge farms that make corn and they take that corn and then they produce ethanol with it. They mix it with regular gasoline and that's called gasohol when they mix it with gasoline and then that reduces the amount of gasoline that we need. Gasoline comes from petroleum, the ethanol comes from corn, you mix those together your engine doesn't care. It'll just burn whatever you put in it usually. 
uh, depending on, it's like limits. Like if you have a, a car, if you look on your gas tank, it'll say no E85. So there's like a 10% ethanol is okay, but 20% is not. You can only go up to 85% gasoline or go down to 85% gasoline. So anyway, this makes less air pollution because it's alcohol, not petroleum. Uh, so that's one advantage of it. Others is it, it's renewable, right? You can grow corn this year, you can grow corn next year, right? And you're not having to dig it out of the ground and it doesn't take millions of years to make. So some states require, especially in the Midwest where they're producing this, they require gas to haul on your vehicles as a way to reduce the air pollution. So I lived in Nebraska for a while when I was in the Navy and I lived in Nebraska and you couldn't get regular gasoline. All of it had 10% ethanol because that was a state law or whatever. But we're still in the preliminary stages and certainly we're not gonna produce enough to, to make a big difference. On the other hand, Brazil, for example, I was reading Brazil, they produce a lot of sugar cane in Brazil and their government doesn't have any oil. Like the United States has oil, they don't have oil. So they've uh, actually produced a tremendous amount of ethanol using sugarcane in Brazil. And that is a big part of their energy requirements and their cars are, are made to burn it. Let's move on to another renewable source of energy, hydroelectric. You remember hydro means water. You know what electric is. So you make, electricity using water and they've been doing this for certainly hundreds of years if not a thousand i think they've been doing it for a long long time in fact in the early stages of the colonial period in america most of the power most of the factories and everything were run using hydro power not electricity because we didn't have it back then but they would have a put it their mill on a stream they have a big paddle wheel. The water from the stream turns the paddle wheel. That turns the machinery inside the factory. So I've been doing this for many, many years. But then once electricity, in the electricity age, say 1930s onward, we started building huge dams. A dam is uh, where they stop the water, collect it in case it, uh, you know, it's not subject to rain, right? And it's not a stream, it's a huge reservoir. So they built some big ones. For example, the Hoover Dam in Nevada, I think is one of the largest dams in the country, in this country. And they, they built a huge concrete stop. It flooded the land and then they used, run water through turbines to generate electricity. Across the entire world, you can see how much electricity we're generating this way, 20%. So that's substantial. You remember that's more than nuclear energy. And in China, even, they're still building dams, right? China's got 1.3 billion people. They have tremendous energy requirements. They're developing, they're becoming more like us. So they're bringing on coal plants, they're bringing on hydroelectric plants. They are building some massive dams right now in China. In the United States, not so much. The ones that were built in the United States were built in the 1930s through the 1950s. So we stopped building them mainly because you have to flood an area and we don't like to do that. We don't like to build a dam, stop up the water, flood all the stuff. In fact, an interesting story, my great grandfather lived in Oklahoma. Uh, he was a Sooner, which means he, Oklahoma was Indian territory. And they set a date that they're gonna open up Indian territory for settling. And some people left earlier than the date. So they call them Sooners. So in Oklahoma, the Sooners means they went before the date was open for settlement. My grand, great grandfather was one of the people. He left Arkansas, went into Oklahoma and kind of found a good piece of land on the river. And they stole all that land from the Indians, depending on your point of view. But he got that piece of land, farmed it for many, many years. When he died, my great uncle Willow got it. But then the government came in and built a dam on the Canadian River and flooded my great grandfather's land. And they gave him like pennies on the dollar and said, we're taking your land. So anyway, that's one of the issues. And that's why I don't think we're doing that much anymore. This is the way it works. So you would build some type of, if you ain't looking at the screen, look at the screen. You would build some type of stop here. You should make out of concrete, dirt, 
clay, whatever you can get to stop. So they dam up the river. When they build this, the river backs up, right? Normally it'd be this deep. When they build this thing, it comes up to where it's just trickling through or whatever. And usually they'll reroute the river while they're doing this. It's a big operation with a huge environmental impact. That's one reason we stopped doing it. But anyway, you build a channel through your dam. That channel, the water rushes through under pressure, but has a lot of energy, right? So it's falling into a turbine, making the turbine spin. When the spinning turbine can be used to, that energy in the turbine can be used to make electricity. That electricity is routed through transformers, stepped up and sent to the city. For example, the Hoover Dam powers Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a main customer of the Hoover Dam and it makes a lot of electricity and Las Vegas uses a lot of electricity because they're the city of lights and they got casinos and all this stuff. So, and they're kind of a modern city. They were built after electricity came into wide usage. There's a lot of benefits to this. They are expensive to build, but they're relatively inexpensive to operate. Once you build them, the water just keeps coming. Right? Whenever it rains, the snow melts and all this stuff, it replenishes itself. They don't pollute the air, right? The water just comes through and spins. There's no emissions or anything like that, like there is with coal plants or natural gas plants. They last a long time. The Hoover Dam's been operational since the 1930s and it's still making electricity today. You could also, controlling the river is good because the, if there's a lot of rain, people who live on the river don't get their houses flooded usually because the lake level just comes up. If they anticipate a big storm, they can lower the reservoir level. And there's one, there's several in the United States, for example, and you ain't gotta go very far. Anybody know Lake Blackshear? Give me a thumbs up if you know about Lake Blackshear. So just south of Make, uh, Warner Robins, you go 20 miles south, there's Lake Blackshear. That is built by a dam. So the dam uh, stops a river. I think it's the Flint River, I'm not sure. But anyway, that generates electricity and it also helps control the flooding here. So the lake level will go up and go down. If it doesn't rain for a long time, there's still water there, but the lake level will come way down. Uh, another one is, uh, you go northeast of Warner Robins and to Lake Sinclair. That's built. All the lakes in Georgia are made by these type of dams. There's no natural lakes that I know of in Georgia. So they're all made by man from activities in the 1920s or even earlier or later. However, like anything else, there's trade offs. Uh, you're going, if you change the body of water, create a lake, you're, you're changing the nature, you're changing nature and there's going to be some consequence, right? It's going to affect those species and organisms. You're going to affect the habitat, you're going to affect all sorts of stuff. They had one, they built a, a dam and they basically, in Egypt I think, and they killed all the anchovies, right? So the anchovies were living in the river when they built the dam and killed them all. So just an unintended consequence. They disrupted the ecological situation of that species and they all died off. I remember it was in California and they had a dam and the salmon would swim up the river to where they were born, that's what they do. And then they collect in the dam because it can't go no further. In fact, uh, when I went to California, the, the fishery where they bring this fish in and hatch the eggs was at the bottom of the dam. So that was as far as they could go and they built it like a little water ladder where the water spills down from the fishery and the fish would swim up there. It's fascinating to watch. You can look at videos on the internet. But anyway, whatever you're gonna do is gonna impact the environment. Obviously, if the dam floods, right, then people like my grandfather are gonna be displaced. All right, if it bursts, oh, you're gonna have a disaster, right? And this happened uh, famously in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. New Orleans, the storm itself didn't damage the city of New Orleans, but the water collected in Lake Pontchartrain around New Orleans and it flooded and some of the dikes broke and oh my goodness, was it a disaster. It had so much flooding, the entire city of New Orleans was flooded. 
uh, it was a bad scene. So that's one of the disadvantages. If you don't maintain it or you get a super bad storm, something bad could happen to you. Now, if you live on a water source, you could even generate your own electricity using micro hydropower, right? So you just use that and we've been doing that for hundreds of years, but like I mentioned, the old factories that were built on streams and stuff. So, but, and that's cheaper, but who knows what's happening. I don't think it's a major source of electricity at the moment. But if you get in a pinch, you could implement that among your suite of solutions for your energy requirements. Let's move on next to something called geothermal. Geo means the world and thermal means heat. So the earth makes heat. Inside the middle of the earth is a bunch of molten iron. And that's covered by solid rock. And on top of that is liquid rock. And then floating on the liquid rock is the earth's crust. So there's a lot of heat on the inside of the earth. Molten iron, you can imagine how hot that is. So theoretically, you could use this energy to warm, to generate electricity and all the other stuff. Now, the United States, we're a leader in this, just like a lot of energy production. You use the Earth's heat to make electricity. It's renewable because the Earth is a stable temperature. You're not going to extract, extract enough heat to significantly impact the temperature of a huge Earth. So let's see, they generate electricity, the steam rises in a well, run a turbine, and put the water back into the hot rock down below you. The liquid or whatever pretty much get released. It's not a big deal. You can cycle it through. It's renewable. So that is could be a, a good source of energy. Here's what it looks like. They have a power plant. They run the water, the cold water goes down into the earth. Now the earth is really hot once you get thousands of feet down. So that water gets hotted, heated, comes up, heated, and then now becomes steam. It doesn't even have to be super that hot once you add uh, vacuum temperatures and things that turn turbines. There's all sorts of science goes into this. But anyway, you could use a plant like this to make energy, and we do, but it's not a super major source. Let's see if it tells us how much we got. So there's about, say, 100 million households in the United States, 320 million people. Household size could be around three, uh, two adults and a kid or something. It varies. Your family's different than everybody else's. But anyway, 600,000 homes in the United States are heated and cooled using these heat pumps. Okay, so let's see what it looks like here. You could do it in your own house, theoretically, because the ground is hot down there. If you, if you have the technology or you build it this way, really, is what you're talking about. Or you have some land next to your house that you could dig a big hole and put something like this in. So you would dig a huge hole, run your cold water in, it gets heated and comes back to your house warm. That could be used for heating or whatever else you want to use it for. Theoretically, if you go deep enough, you can make your own electricity, but I think it's mainly for just heating your house. So that makes it easy and don't have to use electricity. You don't have to use solar. You use that. And oh, by the way, at night, it's still hot down there, right? It comes and goes a little bit, but, but the temperature is pretty stable once you get way below the earth. So this is a good source. I wonder how many homes are doing this to see if they tell us. In the summer, the ground is cooler in there and the fluid cools the home in the summer. That's good. In the winter, it's warmer and it heats the home. So that's like the best of both worlds. So there you go. That's uh, some information about renewable energy production.